tonight, chaos on campus. Let them go! Let them go! Let them go! Columbia University students say yet to a move out order. Will lawsuits get the administration to do the right thing? Jewish students fight back. Wake up, commies! Wake up! Wake up! And President Biden's favorite TV anchor delivers a stern warning. They're helping Donald Trump. They're going to elect Donald Trump if they keep this up. What would Reagan do? You are the ones who are out of step with our society. You are the ones who willfully violate the meaning of the dream that is America. It's not the economy. It's the price of eggs, car insurance, and home prices. It's clear Americans are starting to feel President Biden's strong economy. They're not. And new polling shows why low unemployment numbers don't matter to voters. And it's spreading. Bird flu. Bird flu. Bird flu. Bird flu. (laughs) New concerns as more traces of bird flu are found in milk across the country. It's now spread from cows to dolphins, even walruses. Why it's when, not if, humans start getting sick. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is confirming the first case of human-to-human transmission in the United States of the novel coronavirus. We start with breaking news, 7 p.m. in New York City, where anti-Israel protesters at Columbia are defying orders from the university to clear out of their encampment. The school ordered them to leave more than five hours ago. We're also keeping a very close eye on protests at George Washington University in D.C. and the University of Texas at Austin. Police and protesters have clashed for hours as they try to clear out the encampment at the University of Texas. That's not going anywhere. We're tracking more than 50 protests nationwide. It has grown over the weekend, uh, not only in size and scope, but in rhetoric and in violence. Uh, and in some of the chants in New York, North Carolina, Wisconsin, California, and Missouri. Columbia is ground zero for these anti-Israel, at times pro-Hamas protests that have swept the nation. Jewish students just sued the school for creating an unsafe environment. So far, the school hasn't taken any action to protect them. We'll talk to their lawyer, Jay Edelson, in a minute. We start at Columbia, where pro-Hamas protesters remain defiant quite literally, News Nation's Rich McHugh, live for us this evening. Good evening, Rich. Hey, Leland. So chaos on campus today. The Columbia said 2 p.m. was the deadline where they were going to start handing out uh, suspensions for students that are still in the encampment. And here we are, five hours later, the encampment exists. Students have made no efforts to leave. Uh, They are staying put. This is quite a stalemate. Uh, earlier, just before 2 p.m., you could hear cheers out on Broadway. The students were, were, were saying, are we in unison? And then they, were, they cheered. It was almost unanimous. Several of them walked out, but mostly it was unanimous. I also want to show you just over my shoulder here, uh, a surprise to many, was the faculty came. Uh, those are the ones wearing the, the multicolored shirts here. They came and made a human barricade at the entrance to the encampment, not allowing the administration or anybody in to begin those uh, suspension process. We're told as of 5.30 p.m., uh, suspensions have started. They've started giving out suspensions to students. Uh, but as of right now, it looks like we have a stalemate that's going to last uh, for the foreseeable future. There's really no end in sight here. Students I talk to uh, say, like, look, we're, we're ready for this to, be, to move on. We're in the library behind us studying. Uh, those that are out here at 2 p.m., we're parading around this whole encampment, uh, probably 2,000 of them, Uh, in support. So it's, uh, there's no end in sight and the school has just a real issue on its hand from how they're, how they're, how they've handled it and how they're going to handle it. Like there's real no clear roadmap, Leland. Yeah. And they seem to have no credibility in terms of they make threats, right? Because they've said you got to clear out and now uh, the kids haven't and nothing's happened. So there you go. Plus finals, plus graduation. Rich, uh, stay at it. We'll come to you back to you as uh, news warrants for sure. The protesters, well, Thank you. they may know what they're doing is wrong. You saw one guy walk out of the encampment and he took right. off his mask there Thanks, Rob. in Rich's video. And we know that the protesters know things are bad because they're wearing masks. They won't talk to anyone. And they probably should be reasonably ashamed of what they're doing. We're getting a far clearer picture of actually what their end game is. This is live pictures of the University of Texas at Austin. You can see them shouting uh, at police there. Uh, there is Texas state troopers who are backing up 
this group of officers, but you could see things being flown now. Let's listen in for a second. It's hard to figure out exactly what they're chanting uh, in this protest. If there's clashes, we're going to go up to it. But what a play for you real quickly, and this is important, and it's important to really listen to what's being said at George Washington University's campus a couple of days ago. There's only one way. All right, so as we look back live at the University of Texas, you can see people being led away. There's reports that there's been some tear gas uh, fired there as things got violent um, in terms of clashes with police. We'll see if that continues. Uh, you got the umbrellas that are pretty uh, customary, at least among Antifa uh, protesters. Palestinian flags so far. I don't see any Hamas flags, but we'll check in there. Uh, Jewish students, uh, who are understandably extraordinarily terrified of what they're seeing and the chants about killing them and killing the Jews and a revolution and intifada are fighting back. Take a look at how some students tried to send, well, their own message. As that man noted in the beginning of the video, he had no idea how to play the trumpet. Students are fighting back legally. Perhaps that may be the only effective way. One Columbia student just filed a class action lawsuit against Columbia. The student claims the anti-Israel protests prevented her from finishing a final exam. It goes on to say, the encampment has been the center of round-the-clock harassment of Jewish students who have been punched, shoved, spat upon, blocked from attending classes, and moving freely about campus. It also directly quotes someone that we have been focusing on in our coverage, Kamani James. The school reportedly disciplined him for these comments. Zionists, they don't deserve to live comfortably, let alone Zionists don't deserve to live. The same way we're very comfortable accepting that Nazis don't deserve to live, fascists don't deserve to live, racists don't deserve to live, Zionists, they shouldn't live in this world. Jay Edelson is with us. He represents the students in this case, just filed the lawsuit a couple of hours ago. Jay, uh, thanks for being with us. Columbia now says they're suspending these kids. Look, this is chilling uh, what, here. What else, I'm what else do you want them to do? Th this situation is chilling. Um, We've, you know, we believe in protests. We think that, that it's a great thing if people speak out for whatever they believe in. Uh, we're happy to have debates about what the proper response is to a terrorist attack on October 7th, whether Israel uh, acted too aggressively. There's definitely a humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Uh, happy to talk about whether Egypt should open its borders. Everything's on the table, whether we should divest from Israel, all of those things are fine, but, but as you showed from your clips, what's going on is something different. Uh, there are straight out calls for the genocide of Jews. Uh, this has happened because of complacency and appeasement uh, by our ac academic institutions. Um, when, when we saw Harvard Law presidents say calling for the genocide of Jews, maybe that's okay, it's all contextual, you see why these students then feel empowered. The difference is this isn't the 1930s. We're not in Germany. We're going to stand up, and we're going to fight back. Uh, we filed this class action lawsuit, and we're not going to sit by the sidelines. This is not going to happen again. All right, live pictures right now at the University of Austin. Now, you, you said you filed the lawsuit. Uh, we understand Columbia has suspended some of these kids who are engaged in this. They say everybody who's in the quad is going to be suspended. Who knows whether we believe them or not? Uh, but to that point... What else do you want them to do? If they're, they're suspending the kids, you can't, you can't keep people from saying things. No. Uh, 
well, they can say whatever they want as long as they're not inciting violence. The, the issue is Colombia every couple of days says, we're going to suspend you, and then they don't. And what we saw, their sister called uh, Barnard at suspending kids and then gave them amnesty, which is one of the negotiation points. The, the idea, by the way, that schools are negotiating with, with these people is insane. You look at other schools, like University of Florida, that right away, boom, we're suspending you, and everything got tamped down. So what are we asking uh, Columbia to do? Actually enforce its own DEI policies. Uh, under the DEI policies that have been longstanding for many years, you're not allowed to engage in this behavior. You should be immediately suspended and kicked off campus. Um, we, we have been speaking to them today, and I can tell you that it's actually been positive, the engagement by Columbia. Uh, now, I, I, I will believe it when I see it, uh, but, but we need to actually establish some real order there so that all students can be free to, to walk safely on campus. Right. We've talked to a couple of students who, who obviously feel threatened, as, as anybody would, if you're chanting at people about intifadas and, and violence and from the river to the sea. Um, there, there's an irony, right, in that the, the woman who is representing Columbia uh, in this is the same woman who, who sued uh, on behalf of those at Charlottesville. So in, in one sense, she's very, very concerned about anti-Semitism uh, in Charlottesville and is uh, not so concerned, or at least defending Columbia, uh, when it when it happens from from the left, well, my issue is the real Lynn, Lynn, I I hate to defend Columbia, but I want to push back on that. Lawyers are allowed to defend uh, whoever they want, and uh, we've talked to her, and I believe that her heart's in the right place, and she wants to okay. stop this. Fair and enough. but again, it's wait and see. They've said a lot of okay, things. Fair, 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 and, fair and enough, and I, and I appreciate it. Hold it. The, 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 I, the, I, wait, you have to think about who the real problem is, right? And Colombia's president has taken it on the chin. Obviously, uh, her words have become pretty meaningless, um, which is happens when you threaten people and then you don't follow through and you're in a position of authority. We asked every one of Colombia's board members uh, to come on television tonight to talk about what's happening at the university that they're on the board of. Uh, in, I, I know that you're, you're suing Columbia and you hope that, that perhaps the power of the purse um, gets to these people. But when you look at the group of the Board of Trustees, which is who the president takes orders from, they don't really care about lawsuits. It's not going to affect them. They're far more interested in uh, being seen as liberal and accepting and on and on and on. How do we get to actually getting, forget justice, just safety for your clients? Well... Well, we're done listening to Columbia's promises. They, they can now put up or shut up. If they don't, what's great is we've got a, a strong American judicial system. We will go to court. We're seeking immediate injunctive relief. And we, we expect... What does that, that, that mean? What that means is that we're asking the court to order Columbia to keep its students safe. Um, and if the court gives that order, then Columbia is going to have to follow it. And we're sure that it will follow the law. So you, uh, so you, what you, so you want... Like, you want Jewish students to have private security details? How does this actually work? Well, we're negotiating right now with Columbia, and I, I don't want to talk specifically about uh, what the solutions are, but you see on other campuses how they've taken care of it. You see yep. the ones where, where they've just botched it. More appeasement leads to more violence. Being very clear, following through, getting rid of the small percentage of protesters who are, who are trying to stir up violence. That is their goal. They, they do not believe... In, um, they don't believe in, in safety, and they don't really believe in America, too. They're calling specifically yeah. for terrorist attacks on students and on America. These, these are people in our American no, we, we, We've reported on it, Jay, without, without question. Um, let us know how things turn out, um, and if good actions follow these good words, uh, you will have brought uh, some real good here. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thanks for having good me Good to on. see you. Yeah. Well, Wall Street... Ended near record highs today. Unemployment is still at near record low numbers. Yet, poll after poll shows the economy might sink President Biden's re-election chances. Trish Regan on why President Biden can't change how people feel about the economy. And new concerns about the spread of bird flu across America. Why we are making the same mistakes we did with COVID. But this time, nobody will listen. The president's favorite newscast started out this morning with a warning for him. Is this an advertisement to his voters that essentially says elect Trump? And they're helping Donald Trump. 
they're going to elect Donald Trump if they keep this up. They're going to elect Donald Trump if they continue stirring this chaos. They being the protesters, the Washington Post is worried too. Trump GOP sees on campus protests to depict chaos under Biden. Republicans highlight images of turmoil through most of the pro-Palestinian demonstrations that have been mostly peaceful. We've heard that before. Washington Post is worried because they should be. New CNN polling on Biden handling of Israel war among young voters, 19% approve, 81% disapprove. When it comes to Republicans, 13% approve, 87% disapprove. Then there's the independents, 27% disapprove, 73 disapprove. In other words, nobody is happy. Biden is trying to placate both the far left and the center. Playing both sides does not work in times that require moral clarity. Just ask Ronald Reagan. He faced similar unrest, even worse, during the 1969 protests at UC Berkeley until he brought in the National Guard. Why did you negotiate many times? Negotiate? What is Governor to negotiate? What is? What are we University just, is a public institution. That's it's right. Important institution but the university, for all of the, the, its own community, and for the community of Berkeley that live around it. All of it began the first time some of you who know better and are old enough to know better let young people think that they had the right to choose the laws they would obey as long as they were doing it in the name of social protest. Here now, former special assistant to the president, press secretary to Vice President Mike Pence, Mark Lauder, Democratic strategist, former advisor to Bill and Hillary Clinton, Richard Goodstein with us. Gentlemen, good to see both of you. Richard, how does President Biden get out of the problem that Morning Joe just described? Well, um, first of all, I think this polls are not as bad as, as the CNN poll. We've got a Marist poll that, you know, has Biden up five nationally. We have the... the benchmark uh, for college students, the uh, Kennedy Center Institute of Politics poll that has Biden well ahead among college students who are likely voters, and if Trump gets convicted, by ahead even so you more. So, so you're saying you don't see these protests, live pictures of Austin will put up, you don't see these protests as a threat to President Here, Here's Biden. what I think they need to get to the bottom of. How many of these are not students? Because the actual students at Columbia, Yale, and I'm guessing maybe even Harvard, Harvard, are smart enough to know if they, because the issues they care more about are climate change, gun safety, abortion, uh, racial equity, all, if they are rank ordering all their issues, we see this, they care more about that than Gaza, which is at 2%. So if they're really as smart as I think these students are, then they can see that it's counterproductive to the fact that the person that they're trying to, uh, that they, at the end of the day, the issues that they care about will will be advanced by Mark, Biden you, and not by Trump. I don't understand this argument, do you? What's, what, no. So, I mean, basically, look, Bi Biden is trying to thread a very thin needle, and it's a two-state solution, Michigan and Minnesota. He is so unpopular. And if you look at the Reuters poll from just a few weeks ago, you know, Biden won with young voters by 24% in 2020. He's now only leading by 3%. And I don't think it's Gaza. I think it's inflation. They can't afford homes. They can't afford gasoline. They can't afford we got, yeah, we got Trish, all of we got those things. On, on the economy issue later. I guess my point, Richard, is, is this, is that it may not just be these voters. I'm not sure why it matters whether they're students or not. They're, these are all people who would normally be voting uh, enthusiastically for Joe Biden, certainly did in 2020. My question is this. There's a, there's a feeling of disorder in America. And when you've got this happening on college campuses and you've got people chanting about intifada and revolution and care carrying the flag of Hezbollah and carrying the flag of Hamas. Americans see that and they just feel weird about it, don't they? Right. How does he solve that? Here's the answer. Uh, Joe Biden is saying that anti-Semitism is wrong. Donald Trump has dinner with very prominent anti-Semites, very prominent white nationalists. Those are part of his base. That's who he summoned on January 6th when he told the Proud Boys to stand by their prominent anti-Semites and white nationalists. So to the contrast, and these students know that, these students know that there's a, gra a world of difference. And incidentally, again, the Harvard poll, the most recent one, had Biden up 23 among college students. So, I mean, you can talk about you, polls you all you want. You whether it needs enough. I, I guess... You, you think, though, about Donald Trump in this situation, Mark. Donald Trump has done something oddly that he never does about a situation, which is be quiet about this. 
Yeah, I mean, he actually sees this imploding in front of Joe Biden, and when your opponent is self-destructing, don't get that in that their way. Yeah, he, I, th he's, I think he's learning on this okay. one. But uh, the other thing I was, we have to say is, look, it's very clear right now. I mean, Joe Biden has waffled back and forth on supporting Israel and supporting these these terror, these radical pro-terrorist uh, protesters, and it's very well, he clear. Well, both sides did. I mean, I, I don't think he ever supported them, but he... he, well, he both, both sides kind of worked he, for he, Joe Biden. So that was part of his he campaign. Both, he both sides. Hold on. I, just, it, it's interesting, though, when you think about how the rhetoric from the president, it matters. What the president says does matter. This was Ronald Reagan at the Brandenburg Gate, 1987, speaking about communism versus the West and freedom. Take a listen. I have read and I have been questioned since I've been here about certain demonstrations against my coming. And I would like to say just one thing, and to those who demonstrate so, I wonder if they have ever asked themselves that if they should have the kind of government they apparently seek, no one would ever be able to do what they're doing again. Where is that kind of statement about these protests that are unquestionably anti-Israel and parroting Hamas talking points from Joe Biden? I mean, again, he has put out as clear a statement as possible about, the, about how anti-Semitism is wrong and the universities need to stand up to it. Again, Trump embraces the most famous anti-Semites in this country. That's a contrast that's as stark as well, any. You can point out, and you can dismiss it. You can wish the word not happening, but it's I'm not dismissing it. It's undeniable. You think, about, you think about where Donald Trump is right now. The one person who was seen as a real threat to him in the uh, primary was Ron DeSantis. Uh, some of the highlights of him and Ron DeSantis. Go back. DeSantis is gone. He's uh, just about over. I think he's lost every high roller. And they say, what's his problem? I say, he's got no personality. I could have told you that a long time ago. A politician needs a little personality. He's holding an event right now to compete with us. There's only one problem. Nobody showed up. No. So I'm not, I'm not a big fan. All right. That was then. This is now. I'm very happy to have had full enthusiastic support of Ron DeSantis. We had a great meeting yesterday arranged by our mutual friend at his beautiful Shell Bay Club in Hollywood, Florida. Uh, is peace upon us, Mark? Yes, I think so. I and mean, this is the time when this happens. Uh, primaries are ugly. They're, they're family affairs. I remember in 2016, little, uh, little Marco Rubio and Lion Ted Cruz. And next thing you know, obviously, they're some of the biggest supporters of the America First, First Movement there is. So you'll see this with Ron DeSantis. I think you will see it also coming with Nikki Haley, uh, you know, down the road, because people are now going to coalesce we're behind the nominee, and we've got to coalesce behind the nominee because when you look, everything Joe Biden has touched has turned into a disaster. So I have a friend who says that Trump loves nothing more than the romance of reconciliation. Uh, should you all, should Democrats fear a more united party as Democrats are be, appear to be coming a more divided party? Yeah. So it, people basically express their opinions through their votes. And in the primaries, since Nikki Haley's gotten out, she's getting 15 to 20 percent of the Republican voters. So you tell me, these are people who frankly know they have no choice, and yet they're making a statement. So if you're confident that those people are going to come back, that doesn't seem like unity to me. Biden's getting 90, 95 percent in his primary. So that's where, and that's the problem. Since Dobbs, Democrats have been outperforming, Republicans have been underperforming across the board, primaries, general elections, you name it. And the betting odds still have Joe Biden up. Right. Um, all right, he got the last word. You get the first word next time. Absolutely. Thank Good you. Good to see you. It's a pleasure Thanks as always. Thank, Thank you. you. It's very possible you or your kids or grandkids' next glass of milk, we all have milk, may come from a cow with bird flu. It's 2024. Cows are getting bird's flu. Why what we don't know about human infections might just kill us. And the one silver lining Joe Biden can't stop talking about the economy in any other year it would have been a win-win for Biden. But this year, a strong economy, well, did it suddenly become a loser? Turns out we have learned precisely nothing from COVID. Doctors warn that the current response to a bird flu outbreak across America means we won't know when it jumps to humans before it is too late. Bird flu cases are likely being missed in dairy workers, reports NBC. 
Experts maintain the milk supply is safe. Their focus is on keeping the people who work with cows from getting sick. So the cases are being missed, but we are working to keep people from getting sick. Sounds terrifying and like there's a lot of cows that are sick and people who might be sick. Director of the WHO Collaborating Center for Studies of the Ecology of Influenza in Animals and Birds. He's also an infectious disease doctor at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Dr. Richard Webby joins us now. Uh, Doc, is this one of those things that are, we're burying our head in the cow manure and not seeing what's happening? Yeah, I think there's a little bit of this going on um, at the moment. It's, uh, you know, this is essentially a bird virus that's found its way into cows. And it's a virus we haven't seen in cows before, so you know we're we're in a little bit learning things on the fly here with this virus. So um, you know, there's a lot of information we've got to learn. What are the risks? How's the virus moving around? You know, and, and currently we don't have the answers to many of those questions, unfortunately. We're going to play you some sound bites, um, and it's a mashup of the early coverage of COVID, now exactly four years ago, a little bit more, and some of the coverage of. The, the bird flu into cows, which has sometimes jumped to humans. Take a listen. This is a virus that affects the lungs, so it sounds a little bit like influenza. Fever, chills, aches, difficulty breathing, <coughs> and a cough. Now to growing concerns about the deadly coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. The breaking news, stay at home. That is the order tonight from four state governors as the coronavirus pandemic spreads. All right, and now we'll play some of the coverage of and from Fox Business about cows being tested. Take a listen. Starting today, all dairy cows must be tested for bird flu before being transported across state lines. This after remnants of the virus were actually found in samples of commercial milk. Is it safe to drink milk? All right, there's some eerie, eerie similarities, is there not? Yeah, absolutely. This is a, you know, they're both viruses that historically had their home in other animals or birds and, again, are at that interface with humans. So, no, absolutely, there's a lot of similarities in terms of where these viruses have come from, what the risk to the human population is. Yeah. All right. So, types of bird flu symptoms, cough, sore throat, pink eye, fever, headache, diarrhea. Okay. Um, do we have any idea what bird flu that's turned into cow flu uh, looks like actually if it gets to humans in a in a mass way is this COVID all over again is it far worse than COVID is it actually what a lot of people thought COVID was which was just the flu yeah I mean there's a, uh, unfortunately a lot of hand waving here this particular virus so this bird flu is you know we've been studying flu for many, many years here, is one of the worst we've seen. So, you know, again, without scaring people, it, it has the capacity to be worse than, worse than COVID, but it's also a virus that we haven't seen in humans before. So as it makes this transition from being a bird virus to a cow virus to a human virus, we don't really know what's going to happen to it. So, you know, as the, the sort of figure you have up there right now is, you know, over the past 25 years, it's been close to a thousand people infected with relatives of this virus we have in cows now and you know about half of those have succumbed but you know there's a there's a decent train of thought that's backed by some data that you know when it makes this transition to being a human virus it won't be quite that virulent so uh, yeah unfortunately right, killing kill, kill, kill 50 percent makes it you know what well more than 50 oh, times as deadly as COVID. i mean that would just be unthinkable it would. We've also got to keep in mind that figure is of the cases that have actually been detected. There have probably been a lot more mild or even asymptomatic cases, of course, that don't go into that denominator. So the real mortality is probably quite a bit lower than the 52, luckily. Yeah. Well, doctor, uh, let me say this. I've enjoyed our conversation. Um, your thoughts and, and uh, have been well received. I'm hoping that we don't have to talk about this again, uh, but I fear we might have to. We'll, uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Live look at Columbia University. Protesters have taken to the streets around campus as the world pays attention to them. Yeah, all these kids. We're going to focus once again on the hostages. Is there new hope that they could return safely and how these protests might be making it harder to get the hostages home? Oh. 
President Biden got a standing ovation for his jokes at the White House Correspondents' Dinner over the weekend, and his re-election campaign got a gut punch this morning. You heard a preview of it in our previous segment. New CNN polling shows him down six points in a head-to-head matchup, nine points if you add in Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Cornell West. At this time in 2020, Trump was down six points to Biden. Bill Clinton's campaign office in Little Rock, 1992, it famously had a big sign hanging when you walked in. It's the economy, stupid. But America's economy at all is doing well. Stocks hit near record highs. Unemployment is near record lows. So it's not the economy. It's how people feel about the economy, their own personal family economy. For example, their grocery bills, sports drinks, up 80%, eggs, 63%, sugar, 53%, frozen berries, up 43%, frozen pizza, up 39%, which explains today's White House briefing. Is the president frustrated that despite the fact that he continues to say what he has done, that some Americans are not feeling the impact? So, look, we have seen some consumer uh, confidence go up over the past couple of months, and I think that's important to note, so he gets it. So he's not going to be frustrated by that. What he's going to do is continue to do the additional work to lower costs. Trish Regan's here, co-founder of the investment research firm 76research.com, host of The Trish Regan Show. Welcome back. It is good to see you, as always. Let's, Let's be fair about this. Let's look forward. Is there anything six months out to the election, that Joe Biden can do, not the economy the way we think about it, but the economy the way people talk about it in a poll, which is, you know, is there money left over at the end of the week? And yikes, that grocery bill is out of control. I mean, unfortunately for him, look, there's some reality to to think about that's going on, Leland, which is that economic cycles are cyclical. And the Federal Reserve has a lot to do with where the economy is. Granted, he made a whole bunch of mistakes early on. I mean, look, if you know you're going to have a conflict with Russia, you don't say, okay, well, let's turn off all drilling in the United States and clamp down on that, because what is that going to do? It's going to limit supply, thereby driving up oil prices. At the same time, you had the Federal Reserve continuing to print money, recklessly so, in my estimation, along with Congress giving out trillions, Joe Biden coming forward with a third stimulus check. So so once the train leaves the station, this is why the Federal Reserve, if they're doing their job right, and they did not, should be measuring this quite carefully. And every time we got indications of inflation, what did they tell us? Oh, it's transitory, transitory, nothing to see here, don't worry about it. And so you had all this inflation getting baked in. The reason people feel so bad, and you can say the economy is great, I beg to differ only because of this inflation, because wages have not kept up with where inflation is overall. And don't forget, it compounds. So, okay, granted, we may not be at 9.6% inflation growth this month, but even if we're up 3% or 1.5%, again, these are all coming on the heels of the other. And so, yeah, people are saying, gee, a few years ago, I paid this. Now I'm paying that. And and you're going to pay that. I mean, we've we've got to get this tempered. We want to shoot for, say, 2% inflation, 2.5% inflation. We don't want 9% inflation. But you're not really going to see it come down. Yeah. All right. So just to, again, be fair about this, um, and you think about the the polling, handling of the economy, uh, 64% approve of Trump's handling, 33% disapprove. Joe Biden, uh, exactly um, the opposite numbers. Uh, Not to get too technical in terms of interest rates and everything else, but Donald Trump spent like a drunken sailor um, at at very low interest rates, did nothing to to long-term base the the national debt, our government debt, at those low interest rates. Uh, And he let the good times roll and benefited from it, and and the economy, quote-unquote, was great. People felt awesome um, under Donald Trump. How much of this is really Joe Biden's fault, and how much of this is he getting blamed for Donald Trump letting the good times roll? I mean, he's raised corporate taxes. He's cut down on the amount of drilling that can happen. I mean, all of these things take take their toll, right? So it's not... While while the Fed... There's plenty of blame to go around here. Let me me be very clear. Um, But I would say that the president has the ability to have some impact. The problem is, Leland... 
It's too late at this point. If Joe Biden said, guess what? I'm going to offer a deal to onshore capital from all those overseas places where, you know, we've got stuff going on. Even if he did that, it's not going to happen in enough time to actually make an impact. Even if he said, I'm going to lower taxes for corporations and individuals right across the board. Again, well, it won't fact, make enough difference. In fact, he did the opposite, right? He said today right, right. that the Trump tax I mean, he's never going to do that. I'm just saying, let's, let's play a little well, game. But, no, he, said, he, he said today the Trump's tax cuts... Um, he, when they sunset in 2025, they have to be reauthorized. If you, if reelected, he's not going to go along with continuing the Trump's ca- tax cuts. Uh, take a listen to his press secretary. There is a contrast here. There's a stark contrast to what we see, what the president has been doing, this administration, the Biden-Harris administration, and what Republicans are trying to do. They literally put out a budget that cuts Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and gives special interest groups, billionaires and corporations, a tax break. The president doesn't believe that. I'm wondering just in the way this works, Joe Biden seems to want to be a middle class, working class president. But at the same time, he needs the progressive elite class of voters uh, to keep him in office. I don't think just purely from the laws of economics, which are not repealable, you can have both, can you? No, I don't think you can. I mean, and again, I'll go back to the Trump administration, whatever you think about Trump. By the way, he had some smart people there. My former co-host at CNBC, Larry Kudlow, was part of that team. He was surrounded by some really smart advisors. You had some, you know, uh, Cohn, actually, my my former boss at Goldman Sachs from years ago, Gary Cohn. You, You had good people, Steve Mnuchin as well. I think people that knew what they were doing when it came to the economy, I do not trust that this administration has really people that are, they tend to be more political, how do I say, rather than economic. So if you get people that come from the business world, that come from Wall Street, they kind of get it, they understand it a little bit more, and so thus you had policies in place that, you know, whether you want to say they were all Trumps or whether they, he just got the best people around him, whatever you want to call it, they did better for the American economy, including, by the way, the middle class. If you look at the numbers up until March yeah. 2020, when all H-E-double-L broke loose, what you actually saw was the median income for your average American expanded at the greatest rate it had in 50 years, Leland. And so that tells you a lot. Actually, you saw a depression in the wealth of the wealthy. And that was in part because they lived in California and New York. And guess what? Their taxes did not go down. Their taxes went up a lot because he got rid of that loophole where you could deduct your state taxes. So unless you're in Texas or in Florida, you were paying through the nose. And that was right. a bunch no, of billionaires good point. in California and New York. That's why they're all, all leaving. Trish, it's good to see you. Thank you, as always. We appreciate it. it. Uh, yeah, economy number one issue uh, for voters across the board. Uh, these protests, though, may become the number one issue for voters across the board. The feeling of unrest in America. The one thing these protesters aren't talking at all about are the hostages, including the Americans held underground by Hamas. In fact, there's a peace deal right now, a ceasefire deal. You won't hear about it from these protesters. Are these protesters making it harder to bring the hostages home? Live to Tel Aviv when we come back with that. The protesters on America's college campuses tell you they are there to support the Palestinians. Live pictures of Columbia University, where the students have still not cleared out, despite allegedly the university telling them to. Their talking points, and when you talk to them and interview them, whether it's in Houston, in Austin, Texas, live pictures there, Columbia, their talking points parent those of Hamas. Neither the protesters nor Hamas, of course, care about the Palestinian civilians. We know that. Because the best thing for the Palestinian civilians is a ceasefire and a return of the hostages held by Hamas. You might think that Hamas is emboldened by the student protesters. Remember, the hostages are held underground in Gaza, likely subject to rape, torture, and starvation. In the more than six months since October 7th, Hamas has allowed many of the hostages to die and probably killed some. Hamas put out a video of one hostage, an American, held without a hand. He had two hands before the October Hamas attacks. Robert Sherman is on duty for us in Tel Aviv tonight. 
As Hamas mulls the latest proposal that is on the table, the stakes are high tonight. As Israel says, this is effectively Hamas's last chance to cut a deal. If they don't, they're prepared to go into Rafa. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in the Middle East as we speak, trying to grease the skids, in which he said the ball is in Hamas's court. Hamas has before it a proposal that is extraordinarily, extraordinarily generous uh, on the part of Israel. And in this moment, the only thing standing between the people of Gaza and a ceasefire is Hamas. The pressure is being upped in all directions, with Hamas putting out propaganda video of three different hostages in the last week. These two, Omri Moran and Keith Siegel, who's an American Israeli. The wife of Siegel, Aviva, who spent 51 days in captivity herself, issued this plea just moments ago. Bring Keith back to me. Bring back my hope. Bring, bring Keith and all the hostages, their lives, back. We can't handle any more. We've had enough. In Leland, in recent days, we've seen the State Department question how badly Hamas actually wants a deal. They've accused them of effectively moving the goalposts. Israel has said that their IDF top brass has approved their plan to continue the war in the south, meaning they're ready to go if this falls through. Leland. Robert Sherman in Tel Aviv, you can just imagine how the hostages' families are feeling. Live pictures, George Washington University in D.C. Reportedly, the police in D.C. were told to stand down when GW asked them to come in and remove these protesters. Columbia University in New York City, the protests there continue despite threats of suspension. And why would the students leave at Columbia, right? Because the university has threatened them before. More importantly, as we think about the hostages and their lives hanging in the balance, these protesters know that parroting Hamas talking points only makes it harder to bring the hostages home and only makes it harder to get Hamas to make a deal. Why would Hamas right now, when they are now enjoying support in America, ever make a deal? They'll hold out for more. That's what these students want. We hear it in their chants. Here's Chris.